My father was Groucho Marx and Harpo and Chico were my uncles. And uh, my father always used to say when I was growing up, he says, don't ever be an actor. It's a lousy life. <laughs> he didn't know how much they were making today. Anyway, he was on Broadway at the time starring in uh, Animal Crackers and Coconuts. And we lived in Great Neck, Long Island. And my father was a great father because he worked at night and he was with me all the daytime. So, uh, but he, he was very intent about my not being an actor. He didn't, because he had, he had grown up uh, in the days of vaudeville and touring the country and small time vaudeville and he thought it was a terrible life, but he didn't, he didn't know how it was going to be when it, well, he didn't think, think he was going to be in the movies at all. But uh, anyway, he made two movies and when we were living in Great Neck and I was at the Paramount Astoria Studios and uh, there was Animal Crackers and Coconuts and he played, he was playing, I showed you how much energy he had, he was playing Animal Crackers on Broadway at the same time he was shooting coconuts in the daytime at the Astoria Studios. And, uh, but anyway, after the depression started around 19, the, the crash, 1929, uh, he, the Marx Brothers were signed up by Paramount to come to California and continue making some movies there, which we did when I was 10 years old and I thought that was a big thing to be able to come to Hollywood. And we all moved out here. My father rented a house up in the hills across from where Hollywoodland sign used to be. And it's just Hollywood now. My father used to have all the writers over to uh, play baseball with him in the afternoons. And after I got out of school, I would play with them. There was Arthur Sheikman and Nat Perrin and Sid Perlman. My father bought a house on Hillcrest, uh, south south of south of uh, Sunset. And this was a big house. It had six bedrooms, six baths, three maids rooms, and an acre lot. And that cost him to buy it was $23,000. <laughs> it's hard to believe the prices in those days compared with today. But to, to then, to, for my father, that was pretty steep because the Marx Brothers were only getting like uh, $75,000 a picture for all three of them. I can't believe that to today. They, would be making 25 million a movie. Anyway, that's how we, uh, that's how I got to California. My father used to take me to the studio and uh, that's how, that's how I, and he would always tell me, if you're not gonna be an actor, be a writer because he said it was easy being a writer it's not easy for me, but it was then. And uh, so that's how I got started in the writing business because uh, he never went around much with actors or other movie stars, but all of his friends were writers. I went to, went to uh, USC for a year and then I went into the service. I was in the Coast Guard for four years and uh, which wasn't a bad life. I didn't mind. As a matter of fact, it was going than, better than going to college, I thought. And uh, so that's how I, my father by then was, well, first he was married to my mother and that lasted 21 years. And then they got divorced 
and he married Kay Gorsey, who was Leo Gorsey's wife, and uh, they were married six years, and my father had a little girl with Kay, who's Melinda, and he used to have her on his show, You Bet Your Life. He would give her guest shots, and he was very proud of her. He didn't want me to be an actor, but he wanted her to be an actress. And then they lasted about six years, and they got divorced, and then he married uh, Eden Hartford, and they stayed married about 14 years until they got divorced, everybody getting divorced. While he was making movies at Paramount, he, he uh, made Duck Soup with the Marx Brothers which is now kind of a f famous movie. But in those days, it didn't do very well, and they got dropped by Paramount. And my father was pretty upset about that, but what could he do? He'd already made five movies for Paramount. So he decided he wanted to get into radio because he thought that was an easy life. All you had to do was stand in front of a mic and read the lines off. And we got, uh, he, he did a lot of guest shots on radio in the middle 50s, but he never had a show that lasted, which was a big disappointment to him, because all his other acting friends were, were, you know, Bob Hope and George Burns and Jack Benny. He uh, couldn't get a show that, that lasted that he was on till finally he was doing a, he was doing a guest shot on a thing called the Walgreen Hour. It was a radio show. He uh, was doing this guest shot with Bob Hope on this show, and Art Linkletter was on that show, and John Goodell who was the producer and the creator of the Art Linkletter show. He, uh, he sat my father down after the show. My father did a lot of ad-libbing with Bob Hope on the show, and Goodell was pretty, was pretty impressed by that. So after the, they finished doing that show, Goodell said to my father, I think I know why you've been a failure in radio all these years, which was pretty, my father wasn't too happy about that. He didn't think he was a failure. Anyway, Goodell says, the problem with you is you're not, you're not, you're not ad-libbing, and that's your great forte. So my father says, well, what am I supposed to do about it? And Goodell said, well, if I come up with a show for you or you can ad-lib on, I think we could make it. So he did, and he came up with a little two-page format for You Bet Your Life. They played radio for about a year, and television started to come in. And, uh, and my father was, uh, he was, well, he was happy about the show because he didn't have to learn any lines. He didn't like r learning lines too much anymore at his age. But anyway, he, the show lasted for two years on radio, and then, then they, uh, they decided to, to photograph it and make it a TV show, which they did. And all the other actors like Hope and Jack Benny and George Burns were all kind of jealous of my father because they had to do script shows and they had to learn lines and my father didn't have to learn lines for You Bet Your Life. So You Bet Your Life uh, was uh, stayed on the air for 14 years, which made my father happy. And all the other actors, Bob Hope, and they finally had to uh, go into television, which was much more difficult for them in those days because they had, had to uh, learn lines, and Bob Hope had, had to have the, the cards that he ran his material, that he read his material off of, and my father was basically ad-libbing 
he had some ad libs, and then some of it was written down on cards. But it was basically an ad lib show, and uh, that's what that's what pleased him the most. So, um, just getting back to you, um, you were in the Coast Guard during the war. Yeah. And uh, then you came out of the Coast Guard, and what happened then? Well, a friend of mine got me named Larry Backman, who was a, he used to write the Dr. Kildare movies at MGM, and he was a friend of mine, and we used to play tennis together because I had been a ranking tennis star. And he got me a job uh, on a thing called with, with Billy Wilder's brother. And uh, we, uh, it was my first attempt at writing a screenplay. And I have to say, I don't think it was very good. But anyway, he, uh, he, I, I got a screen credit on it because I think it was finally called Snow Cinderella. Uh, I got a screen credit on it because in those days the, the writers were arbitrating the credits and I did get a credit on it, but then the movie business went bad right after the war. And uh, I, uh, I, I was fired from the Billy Wilder picture, and, and there wasn't much for me to do. Uh, I, I couldn't get a, a writing job in the movies. Uh, so I uh, went to work. No, I, oh, I got one job writing Blondies for Columbia for Harry Cohn. And he got me fired because he didn't like my father. And my father would, was always insulting everybody. And he, ins I guess he insulted Harry Cohn. Anyway, I got, I got, I, I finished Blondie and I got a credit on it. Then, then the movie business went really bad. And I couldn't get a job after that because all the high price writers were out of work too. So uh, I find I didn't know what to do. I knew Dory Sherry. I used to play tennis with him because everybody wanted to play tennis with me because I was a ranking star. So I finally wrote a letter to Dory Sherry. He was the head of MGM at the time. And I, how about giving me a job? He had written, he had offered me a job once as a, as a reader. So he didn't have a writing job for me. But he had a, he said, if you want to work for MGM as a reader, uh, I'll give you a job doing that for $65 a week, which was a little bit of a come down because when I was at Columbia, I was making two fifty a week. But I had no choice. So I worked as a reader for MGM in the story department for two years, and I found that was a good education in, in studio writing. And uh, so that's what I did. And while I was writing, while I was a reader at MGM, I started writing a novel uh, that, that a fellow named Ken McCormick, who was the head of, of uh, Doubleday at the time, he was kind of intrigued by the premise of a ten tennis player on the circuit, the old circuit. So he said, well, write me three chapters of this book you want to do and, uh, and an outline, and I'll see if I'll publish it. So it took me a year. I was writing at night while I was a reader during the daytime, which I found rather exhausting. But I made up my mind I wasn't going to do anything till I until I finished writing this book. So I wrote the book and I sent it to my agent in New York. It was called The Ordeal of Willie Brown. Anyway, Ken McCormick liked the book, but the other people on the board at Doubleday didn't think it would sell. So they turned it down. And I spent a year worrying about my book, whether it was going to get published or not. And because it was a good book for my, for me anyway, my first ch attempt. So one day, 
I was walking up down the corridor in the big in the big uh, MGM building where all the writers were working and all the producers, and I bumped into a fellow named Sam Marks. He was a very distant relative of my father's, and he was a producer there. And he asked me what I was doing, and I said, "Well, I got this book and I can't get it published." He says. And I says, Jack Goodman liked it. He says, well, I know Jack Goodman. He says, uh, give me the copy of the book and I'll send it to him. So he did. He sent it to Simon & Schuster and they accepted it right away. And that was a big deal for me. I called Scott Meredith, who was the biggest literary agent at the time there. And he, he says, come on, have lunch with me. So I had lunch with him, and I wrote, and he says, well, you have an idea for a book. I says, well, I have this book I've been fooling around with called Son of Groucho. It was uh, a funny book about being, I, uh, about being the son of a famous person. He says, well, that's a good idea. I said, Harper's don't want, doesn't want it. Well, they want me to hold three chapters on it and another whole outline. And Scott Meredith says, well, that's ridiculous. He says, I'll give you a contract for it right now. By the time I went home, I, I, I got a call from my wife who said, there's a call here from you from a fellow named Jack Scoville who works for Scott Meredith. He says he wants you to call him right away. So I did. I didn't know Jack, but he was Scott Meredith's assistant. And he says, uh, we want to do your book where you take $45,000 for it. So by that, again, that was a big, a big deal in those days. So I said, sure. You write anything first? He says, no, just write the book. I like the idea. You wrote a letter on it. That was funny. I didn't want to do it. I always stayed away from working for my father. But uh, I just wrote the book without telling him. I didn't show him the book because every time I showed him something I'd written before that, he would turn it down and say it's not very good. It's, he used to say it's amateur night or something like that. So anyway, when I finished the book and the Saturday Evening Post bought it for $45,000, and those days was big money, uh, so... Uh, I thought, well, then it's okay, I'll show it to my father. So I showed it to him, and he was furious about it, I think, because I didn't show him before. Anyway, he uh, threatened to sue me. My father was kept going back and forth with me, uh, with his lawyer, and I was afraid he was going to try to stop the book. So I didn't know it was impossible for someone to do that in those days. But there weren't very many unauthorized books out in those days. There was Bing Crosby's book and Bob Hope, and uh, it. Uh, and I was I was afraid he was going to be able to stop my book, and so uh, one day I was I had an idea. Uh, I. I uh, sent the Saturday Evening Post the editor, Ben Hibbs. I said, told him to send me two sets of galleys. And I gave one to my father and told him, here it is, mark it up all you want, and uh, that's going to be it. And so he, he spent three weeks rewriting my book. By then, I had already finished the changes on life with Groucho for me. And he, uh, and one day he called me up and says, okay, come on over and get the book. So I did, and it was all marked up with his scribblings. And I, uh, thank you very much, I said. And on the way out of the house, I dropped his copy in the garbage can. And uh, he never knew after that he liked the book after that, I must say. And he, he was just a father exerting his willpower over his son. So that's how 
Life with Groucho got made. And after that, he was pretty nice about the stuff I wrote. He even asked me to work on You Bet Your Life, but I said I'd never work for my father. <laughs> so that's how that happened. I was back and forth in those days from the literary business to the movie business to radio to TV. I could say I was a jack of all trades. I met a fellow at the Country Mart in uh, Brentwood who was named Robert Fisher. He and Alan Lipscott were the two biggest television writers in the, at the time. And uh, he, well, I used to have lunch with him all the time. And I was envious of him because he was making 5000 a week at the time. He was turning these scripts out so fast you'd think they were on a on an assembly line belt. And he, uh, anyway, we became friends. And he, uh, he uh, went, he went to Seattle to r shoot a pilot that he had written with Alan Lipscott. They were the two biggest television writers at the time, writing episodic TV. And he was in, a, uh, in Seattle writing or, or producing this, uh, this uh, pilot, and he, uh, Alan Lipscott died while they were on this, when they were uh, doing this show. So when he, he didn't finish the pilot, and he came back to California, and I was having lunch with him one day, and uh, he was looking for a collaborator. He was the kind of writer who had to have a collaborator, Bob Fisher. So. I said, well, how about putting me on and take Alan Lipscott's place? And he said, well, I'll give you a try. And uh, if, it's, if it works out, you can write, on, you can write these, these uh, episodes at the time. We were doing sort of a half-ass version of the Lucy show. Anyway, and De Dev Freeman, who was a brother of Everett Freeman, who, who, was a, who worked here a lot, he uh, he gave us a, gave me a chance to write with with uh, Robert Fisher, and he liked the first script we did, and we wrote the next three scripts for the episode. It was I can't think of who who uh, the name of the show was. Anyway, from that point on, Bob and I was doing were doing uh, all kinds of. TV work, and then we also worked on a thing called, we wrote a pilot called The Mickey Rooney Show, and it, uh, Mickey Rooney screwed it up, if you want to know the truth. He wasn't writing, he wasn't writing the lines, or reading the lines right. So anyway, it lasted 17 weeks. By then we got bumped off the air, and because it was the Dick Van Dyke show, Mary Tyler Moore show that they put us up against, and that was devastating for us because Mickey's show wasn't that good. So when the Mickey show went off, Sylvia Hirsch, who was Bob's agent at William Morris, said, "Do you guys have any ideas for a new TV series?" And Bob said to her, well, well, we got a play that we wrote. We had written that on a weekend about a year before, and nobody wanted to produce it on Broadway. So we have this play. Maybe you want to look at it, maybe a TV series. So we wrote, uh, we got the play to her, and uh, sh she called us back in three days and said, this is too good for TV. I, uh, I'm going to send it to our agent, my agent, or your agent in New York, whose name was Helen Harvey. She was the biggest play agent for William Morris at the time. So we, so in four weeks, she had four producers for us for, uh, they, it was called The Impossible Years. One day, I'm 
playing tennis. This is what I went back to. And I get a call from Helen Harvey. She says, there's a guy on the phone who wants to talk to you. His name is Alan King. Well, Alan King had done several things, a nightclub acts, and he was pretty good with, with the theater party ladies in New York. So, uh, so Alan got me on the phone. He says, I love your play. He says, and uh, if you don't let me do it, I'll kill myself. That was what he exactly said. I said, well, I don't know, can you do, do a straight play? And he says, well, I'll tell you what, I'm at the city center now playing Guys and Dolls, the Sam Levine part. He says, I'll fly you and your wives back here and you can watch me in the play. So I did, and at the city center, he, uh, he was very good playing Sam Levine's part in Guys and Dolls. And we signed him, and that's how it happened. And with, uh, we were sold out for a solid year with Alan King playing it. And then uh, Sam Levine played it for another year, or two years. And then Tom Mule played it on the road. And that's how I became a, a Broadway success. We not only, it ran for three years on Broadway, the impossible years, but we sold it to MGM for, and uh, David Niven played the lead. We didn't want him to play it. We wanted Alan King who had played it on Broadway, but they didn't think Alan King was a big enough star for the, the movies. So David Niven played it, and it was a big hit movie too. We're gonna to backtrack a minute because there's a lot of things you, we haven't talked about. Um, we've, I mean, you wrote episodes of Dennis well, the Menace and all, General Electric Theater. All in the family. All in the family. McHale's Navy. Maud. Um, Maud. So, yeah. well, Maud was after that, but before that, I mean, we have General Electric Theater. You wrote yeah. um, an episode of that. So uh, you were... Oh, I was sorry Easy about keep, it, huh? You were keeping yourself very comfortable writing yeah, episodes. Yeah, we were making pretty good money doing everything. And, and that's how we happened to get the Mickey Rooney show. Right. And the so Mickey um, you were on McHale's Navy. Yeah. You want to talk about that for a minute? Jennings Lang, who was a friend of mine and a second in command at Universal, he went, he went back east to sell McHale's Navy as a serious movie and he took it back east and they listened to it and they said you gotta be kidding this is the worst thing we ever heard it's a comedy they said it's so bad so Jennings says well how about making it a comedy and it turned out to be a comedy with Joe Flynn and Ernest Borgnine and who else Tim Conway and he sold it to them as a comedy, and it ran for four years when he went back to sell it to them as a serious movie. Well, in those days, uh, you basically, most writers weren't on staff. But we, we were freelanced, and if, you, if, if, we're, if they liked what we did, we got picked up to do more. Uh, when we were doing, uh, when we were doing Alice, Bob and I wrote one script for her, them, and they liked it so much they signed us on a yearly deal. For we did, I did four years of Alice, and uh, in those days you just uh, we had a staff. The staff was me and Bob, and and I can't think of who the other name was, uh, but we. Uh, we wrote, what we would do was we would write us, well, first we would, uh, Madeline Davis and Bob Carroll, I don't know if you remember them, they were the producers at that time. And they loved our first script and that's when they signed us to do it by the year. And uh, we had a good time, they were fun. But in those days you just uh, you submitted an idea and a Bob, and Madeline liked it, they said, go ahead and write the screenplay. And then uh, we'd write the screenplay and we, 
that we would have a, a couple of days before we shot the thing. We used to shoot it live. And uh, I don't know if they do that so much today. We would all sit around a table and the actors would try to mangle the script. And <laughs> we got around that for, for four years and then Madeline and Bob decided they wanted to get some young writers in. So I brought in some young writers who didn't have many credits, but that's, they, they finally decided they liked them better than us after four years. So we quit. We went on and did some more freelance t TVs where you usually submitted an idea and if the producer liked it, he'd assign it to you. And then that's about it. You didn't usually work on the scripts if you were freelancing. You didn't work on it with the actors. You just hoped that they would do something good with it. It was getting harder to get staff jobs as TV went on. I don't know why. I guess it was easier to, 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 to write and, and to, uh, to, to get some continuity in the scripts that were written for uh, when you were freelancing. So that's why they stopped having freelancing mostly and, and, uh, and put them on staff. I have here uh, a list of um, movies in the early 1950s. Gypsy Holiday, Music Quiz, Reducing, Dogs and Ducks, Ain't It G Aggravating, Do Someone a Favor. Uh, and we haven't talked about that oh, period. Oh, well, I was doing Pete Smith. That's what do must do someone a favor. Uh, Gypsy, whatever the name is that. Uh, Gypsy Holiday. Yeah, well, I... I wrote that by myself, and then, uh, and after Pete Smith read one of my articles for Cosmopolitan magazine, he says, "How would you like to write for me?" Because he he was getting his writer who had I can't think of his name uh, got tired of doing Pete Smith, so Pete said, "Come on and work for me." So. He put me on for 250 a week, and I wrote with uh, Dave O'Brien. I don't know if you know who Dave O'Brien was. He was the one who, who was played sort of a idiot on the Pete Smith shorts, and he wasn't an idiot. He was a good writer, and we wrote together. And we wrote, I wrote 12 Pete Smiths with him, and they were all good. And uh, and the movie business went bad again. Did you have any mentors? Were, were there anybody, um, was there anybody who helped you or who sort of guided you through your early career? Uh, not really. I, uh, my father wrote for, a, father, a fellow wrote for my father's radio show bef and his name was Manny Mannheim and he was, he was a good comedy writer. But he wasn't doing anything at that time. So he says, why don't we write a play? This was before the impossible years. I says, well, he, I said, do you have an idea? And he says, yeah, I have an idea. And you have an idea. Let's put it together. So we wrote a play. And he was very helpful to me. And the play was called Everybody Loves Me. And we wrote it in about four weeks. And uh, we sent it to uh, New York to uh, Max Gordon, who was the, one of the biggest producers at the time on Broadway. He had just done, uh, I, I said, he born yesterday. And he sent, he wrote us back and so called us back and said, I want to produce your play. So that was pretty good. This was our first play. And my, Manny had been a big help to me on it, but we uh, we wrote it and we previewed it at the Booth Theater, and it seemed like it was going to be a big hit. And then we opened at the McCarter Theater at Princeton, 
and we got bombed by the critics. We were ready to kill ourselves. And, uh, and we already had a deal to play Philadelphia for two weeks. And uh, so we, we cast Jack Carson. I don't know if you remember him. He was a big actor in those days in movies. And he was quite good in the play, but the critics didn't like it. And that's how, after two weeks, he started drinking. And the curtain came down. Well, he, he started doing drinking after we were on the road. He was not paying any attention anymore to the lines. And the curtain came down in Philadelphia with him drunk on the stage. So Max Gordon had to close the show right then. And that was the end of Everybody Loves Me. And that was the end of my first playwriting experience. I got involved with Bob Hope. One day I'm walking down Rodeo Drive and I'm passing Lou, Louis Schur's office. And I knew Louis Schur. He was Bob Hope's movie agent. So I walked in, I said, hi, Lou. He says, have you got, he says, have you got anything for me to read? I says, well, I have this little story that I wrote, but it's so thin, it's not even a screenplay. In those days, they wanted a whole screenplay. Well, uh, so I showed it to him, and he said, well, he had a stack of scripts on his desk this big. And I said, I gave it to him, and he said he stuck it in the pile of scripts, and uh, that was it. I never expected to hear from him again. And three days later, I got a call from Louis Schur. He says, Bob Hope was in my office, and he saw this little script in this big pile. He says, and he hates reading. So he uh, pulled it out and says, what is this? And he told him. And Bob Hope says, well, I'm going to take it home and read it. So uh, he took it home. And a day later, he says, I want to make, make a movie of it. He had been making a movie with Ray Stark at the time called, uh, called Global Affair. Louis Shore called us up and said, Bob Hope doesn't think this movie scripted he's doing for uh, Ray Stark is any good. He says, how about you and Bob rewriting it? So that's how I happened to start writing for Bob Hope. And we wrote one script, and he liked it. He said, there's another movie called, I'd like you to rewrite two for Bob Hope, called I'll Take Sweden. And uh, that was kind of a, it was a good movie. It wasn't great. But uh, Nat Perrin had written that, and Bob Hope didn't think it was funny. Uh, so we got another crack at rewriting uh, Nat Perrin's script, and it turned out to be a pretty good movie, I'll Take Sweden. And af after that, Bob Hope decided he would like to do, uh, to do the script that Bob and I had written first. I can't think of what we called it. We were going to re rewrite it. He wanted something else done to it. And by then, Bob and I were in London because we were script. We were pu putting our play on there, our, our first play. And uh, so th that, was, th that was how uh, some other people uh, got, the, got the assignment to rewrite our first script which is when Bob Hope liked in the beginning. But, but by that time, he was through at Paramount. And, he, and he's going to produce this independently himself because he couldn't, he couldn't get, it, he couldn't get uh, Paramount to make it. So we were in London, and these guys, I can't forget, I can't remember one of them's name was Snyder. Anyway, they rewrote the script, and it wasn't any good, I didn't think. But that's what happens. I, we were in London. We couldn't do anything about it. We were stuck there writing this, this script. I can't think of I know what it was called. It's called Eight on the Lamb. And we wrote a, we wrote a, it was about a, I, I read a, a story in Life magazine about uh, a bank teller who was accused of of embezzling some money at the bank. He had eight kids, seven kids, 
and they and they went on the he went on the lamb with them because he didn't want to go to jail and it was a funny idea and they wrote it up in life magazine and i wrote it i liked the idea myself and that's how bob and i wrote the screenplay that was the thing that appealed to bob hope in the beginning and then we wrote another one one of his last movies cancel my reservation it was uh it wasn't a bad movie, but it wasn't a good one either. By that time, Hope's movie career was about over. And he got a bad director to do it. He didn't have a comedy director. It was sometimes you needed a comedy director to produce something by Bob Ho with Bob Hope in it. This, this guy was so square you couldn't believe it. And one day, I'm, I'm going, I'm driving to the studio to do something with, El with Bob. And uh, I hear on the radio, it says, uh, uh, lay, uh, uh, Bob Hope's new movie just opened at Radio City Music Hall. And it said it was so bad that they closed it in one night. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't very good either. When you start writing a script, how do you approach it? Do you write an outline first? Do you? Well, it depends. Bob and I used to just sit down and start writing. A lot of people, when they were collaborating, would, one would write part of it and the other would write another part of it. Then they would put the, put the material together. Bob and I never wrote that way. We, we liked to write together because we could amuse ourselves. If somebody said something funny and the other one laughed, then we figured that was a good line. And if you're writing by yourself, uh, you can't get that feedback from an audience, and that's what it basically is. Well, we tried to write the three acts, basically, but, but you just have to write the beginning and the middle and an end. And that's what a fellow named Harry Tugan, who was a big writer out here, he did a lot of movies at MGM. And uh, he told us, instructed us on this business of writing a first act and a second act and a third act. And it was pretty instructive. Well, I'd write till noon and hopefully it was good. And that's how we did it. There's no, there's no standard way writers write. I like writing on my own the best. It's hard to, it's hard to say, but when I was doing television, Bob, Bob was very good at going in and pitching a story, which I wasn't good at. So he wrote, so he would pitch the story and the producer or, or director would say, I like it or I don't like it. So in that sense, I liked working with a collaborator. But when I was writing movies or, 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 or stories for magazines and things, I like writing by myself better because I didn't have to have to go by with the habits of my writer. My, when I was working with Bob Fisher and we were doing the Mickey Rooney show, he wouldn't come in until 11 in the morning and I'd be there producing this and doing it since 8. And uh, we sort of broke up on account of that because he couldn't, uh, he, he wasn't a drinker but he was not a good person to collaborate with me for any way. We, we got, I told you, we went off the air after 18 weeks. And Mickey Rooney still hates us. <laughs> Have you had the same agent? Have you had a lot of agents over the years? I liked, I liked uh, Scott Meredith. I stayed with him for quite a while. And when Jack, his partner, died, I stayed with him. And that was it. What do you think makes a good agent? And what is a good agent writer? Well, a good agent is somebody who recognizes the material right away and says, this would make a good movie. Or uh, you, you'll be good at this going writing on Alice. He, uh, they don't usually... They're not too constructive, most agents, although today a lot of the producers were agents. I don't know why, but that's why the movies are so bad. <laughs> Louis Shore was a good agent. 
But he didn't sit around saying, you should do this or you do that. I had agents who, who did tell you what to do, and usually they tell you the wrong thing because they weren't writers. That was the way they would have written it if they were writers. You've worked with a lot of directors over the years. Um, what do you think makes a good director? And who are some of the good directors that you've worked with? I didn't write a lot with a lot of directors. I knew Billy Wilder. He was a good friend of mine. And he had a great sense of humor. And uh, he even recommended me to his brother, I told you. But uh, I worked with Norman Krasner. He was my father's collaborator on a couple of movies. And he, uh, I used to sit around with them because Krasner used to work at the studio in the daytime and he worked with my father at night. So I would sit around and listen to them talk and they were very, uh, Krasner was very constructive and very good at writing things. I had a director who was doing my first play, Everybody Loves Me, the one with Jack Carson. And he, uh, I, I don't know why, but he, he after loved my, he loved my play and so did Max Gordon. They tried to change, they tr changed it all around when, when we were in rehearsals. And uh, that really s screwed up the play in my opinion. But one of the impossible years, I suddenly can't remember the name of the director. He was very good. He, we sh the producer showed him the play and he liked it and he agreed to do it. And then they had to get someone to play it. They couldn't get John Forsyth, so they got Alan King. And he didn't change anything, which was very good, I thought. If you have an actor who wants to change everything, you're in trouble. I'll tell you one thing about Alan King. We opened and we were a smash hit. And, and uh, he ran, we ran for a year with Alan playing it. And uh, after a year, I went back to New York, not the only time, but I went back there. And Alan took my wife and me out to dinner. And while we were in the, his Rolls Royce by now, his, uh, he, started, he started telling me about how great he was for the impossible years how he changed everything. So I said to him, Alan, you've never, you're not ad-libbing on the stage. All you're doing is reading our lines. And he got very upset about this. And our relationship wasn't that good after that. And is there any sort of peak decisive moment in your career that you, um, that you haven't told us about yet? Is there any kind of big moment that that changed your career or changed your life at all or well when i wrote the impossible when we wrote the impossible years that was such a big hit i mean everybody was telling us we it wasn't any good and we ran for three years on broadway three solid years and we also sold it to the movies for four hundred thousand dollars then and to me that was a high point in my life I wrote things after that that, that were that were getting got good reviews, but nothing like the impossible years. What do you think are the qualities that somebody needs to be successful at being a writer? Well, they have to have they have to be able to take rejection is the main thing, because a lot of things that I've written uh, that aren't accepted immediately. You could be rejected by something, by someone, and three weeks later, someone will like it. And chances are they'll like it better than the first person hated it. My one piece of advice to writers is don't listen to any other writer, because they want to write everything the way they want to write it. And that's, that's, that's the best piece of advice I can give anybody.